and uh, emphasis that I'm taking from John 4 this time is that even you can be an agent of revival. We, we pray for revival for ourselves, but we don't want to be selfish about that. Revival for the church can start with any one of us if we get serious with God. It's really not even dependent on correct theology, although theology does become important in time. It's not dependent on how good a person you are. We look at who God chose for sparking revivals in, in history, Bible history. The woman at the well that we're going to be studying today in chapter 4 of John was a very low person in that society, not respected by the men or the women. She'd been used and abused. Or we look at another story. After Jesus had crossed the lake with the storm, he met the, the Gadarenes. Two madmen came out of the tombs wearing nothing but broken chains. And the disciples ran, but Jesus stood and faced them, recognizing that they were seeking a relationship with God. A couple hours later, when the whole community came and wanted this man who had destroyed their pig crop, letting the pigs go running into the lake, they told Jesus to leave. These two gatherings who'd spent two hours with Jesus or so. We don't know exactly how long. Jesus sent them as missionaries, and they transformed those 10 communities in that area, so that when Jesus came back, the whole group was ready to come and see him, and that's where we find the feeding of the 4,000. Um, agents of revival, the key was they met Jesus. The key for you is to meet Jesus. Um, the Apostle Paul, back when he was named Saul, was actively opposing the gospel. His theology was not merely wrong, it was in opposition to God. But he saw the light. He met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He met Jesus. And Jesus said, Paul, you're eager to do what's right, but you're heading in the wrong direction. And he said, Thank you, Lord. I want to go the right direction. And within just a few short years, he had become the agent of carrying the gospel to the Gentiles. Or another one. Unlikely people who God uses to take the gospel to people. Naaman's wife had a captive maid. I think of somebody about the age of this girl here on the front row. She had been kidnapped from her home and taken to a foreign land and made a slave. But she chose to keep worshiping God, to keep trusting in God. Even in this terrible situation, she kept trusting in God. And so when she discovered that her mistress's husband, Naaman, captain of the king's guard, had leprosy, she said to her mistress, well, it would be good if he could go and talk to the prophet in Samaria because he could heal him of his leprosy. How did she know that? Nobody in Israel had been healed of leprosy. New Testament tells us that. But she knew God. And sometimes children speak bigger than they are. They say things that, that nobody would believe. But <laughs> Naaman took a chance on believing this and went for what he thought was going to be some new kind of surgery to heal him of his leprosy. Well, it wasn't a surgical procedure, it was a faith procedure. Go and dip seven times in the River Jordan. You remember the story? He was healed. Agent of revival. God's looking for people who are willing to be agents of revival. So, um, 
we assume, since you're here in church today, that you have met Jesus, that you have some kind of an understanding of him. And we also assume that you have some friends that you care about. So we've given you these cards, and I like it that we're giving you two cards. Now, merely one for you to keep in your Bible and pray on every day. That's important and useful. But also a card for you to give back to us so we can develop a prayer list for the church to be praying for, that God will pour out his spirit of revival on us and on our community. There's a work that needs to be finished. And I'm not sure when Tracy's going to give these to you, but, but I've got a, a, a set of four works, a set of four books. Um, and the first one, and I put a number one in it because by the time you get all three, four, maybe even five books, um, it, it's good to be able to know. It was book number one that made a difference for me, book number two, whatever. But um, interesting, and this touches on issues of theology. Why do we have differing notions in our church on theology? Well, there's a basic reason for that. Um, the devil is angry with the woman and he's seeking to cause distress and confusion in the church of God. We need to personally get acquainted with Jesus ourselves so that we do not get blown about by every wind of doctrine and let ourselves get confused by the various notions that are going around. So here's this woman. You've got the story there. You've already opened your Bibles to John 4, I'm sure. In verse 4, it says, on his way from Jerusalem to Galilee, Jesus says he needed to go through Samaria. Well, now, if you look at the geography, you can say it was logical for him to go through Samaria. That's the shortest way. But most Jews didn't go through Samaria. They went around Samaria because they didn't want to be contaminated by those heathens. Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Did you ever wonder why? I know at least two reasons. One, there was someone in Samaria who was ready to meet him and be transformed and an agent of transforming that whole city of Sychar. But a second reason, Jesus' disciples needed to recognize that those Samaritans did not have a correct understanding of God Jesus was rescuing them too. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son in order that the Jews might be saved. That's what the Jewish nation believed. But God sent his son in order that whosoever will, including the whole world, might be saved. The disciples needed to have a mind change that they realized that this gospel was for everyone Verse 5, he came to the city of Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. You find in Genesis stories about Jacob digging wells. This is one of the wells that Jacob had dug, and they, they revered this water as special because Grandpa Jacob had dug the well. Now, that doesn't have to make any sense. I like some water taste better than other water taste, and I... I carry water because the water at the house where I'm living does not taste good. <laughs> Turns the toilet rusty. I guess it probably isn't good for my insides either. <laughs> Although I grew up on rusty water. I thought that that's what water was supposed to taste like. But I've, I've learned better. People really liked the water from Jacob's well. And some friends of mine when I was in Israel 20-some years ago made a special trip to Jacob's well. But you remember the story. Jesus is sitting on the edge of the well where there was all this water down deep in the well, but there was nothing for him to drink. And he was a human. He was a person. He recognized his physical bodily needs. And we have nothing in the story that he got physical water at this time. 
he got, he got explaining how more important than the physical water is the spiritual water. And that's why we have communion service periodically to remind us that every drop of liquid that comes into our body was purchased at the price of Jesus' blood. And every crumb of food that we eat was purchased at the price of Jesus' death on the cross. As Jesus was there, a woman came to the well to draw some water. Now, noon is not the normal time for anybody to go get water. Cool the morning, cool the evening for carrying that heavy water pot. That's the normal time. We believe that this woman came at noon because, well, she didn't want to see anybody. She was embarrassed. She had lived a life of sin. She was not respected by the community. And she didn't want to talk to anybody. So she came there and very politely, she's a Samaritan woman and she knows that Jews don't talk to Samaritans and especially Jewish men don't talk to Samaritan women. That would be just horrible for them to do. And so she politely ignored him, acted as if he wasn't even there. <laughs> Jesus, instead of offering her something, he asks for help. There's a lesson in that. Sometimes the best way we can open the doors of communication is to express our own needs. And folks, we all have real needs. And as we ask for help, we, we open that flow of sympathy, which then can go both ways. And while we all have needs, we also each have something, someone, that we can share with others. And those ways of sharing are, well, they're wonderfully expanding. I'm not very much involved in social media, but I will not condemn those who are, although I will caution them to be careful. Your Twitter account, Facebook account, whatever these are, whatever you're involved with, WhatsApp, those, those can consume you and lead you away from time with Jesus but they also can become an opportunity for you to share Jesus. So go in the fear of God, because we who have drunk of the water of life have something to share with others. The interaction, you've read the story, is very interesting back and forth, but eventually you see she having been confronted with her need She's trying to avoid the things and says, well, our father Jacob gave us this special well, special water. Are you greater than our father Jacob? Well, Jesus doesn't quite say yet, yes, I am. But pretty soon he gets to that. Because then she asks, move on down in the story. She asks, our fathers worship here in Samaria, Mount Gerizim. But you Jews say that the place to worship is Jerusalem. And Jesus says, yes, salvation comes from the Jews. The temple in Jerusalem is containing a much more pure theology than what's happening. In, it has already been destroyed. Both temples have been destroyed. Well, the temple in Jerusalem was still extant. It had had another 40 years to go. But um, that is the new rebuilt temple. But the one in Gerizim had already been destroyed. But Jesus says, the theology there is more correct. And then, then she presses to say, well, we are told that Messiah is going to come. Are you a prophet? And Jesus says, I am the Messiah. He, he never was so clear to the Jews in Jerusalem of who he was. He pointed, he hinted, but he never said so clearly to them, I am the Messiah. But to this pagan woman. He admits it and he says it clearly. And she believes. She accepts. She connects with God. Having connected with God, and you read the story, about that time the disciples are coming back and they're wondering, what's he doing talking to this Samaritan woman? But they didn't say anything. They just wondered about this. And uh, she left her water pot. She ran to the city gates where she was embarrassed to be before. The city gates is the courthouse. It's the place where the leaders of the community are passing judgment. 
but she goes directly to the leaders of the community and she says, come, you must meet a man who told me everything that I ever did. I believe he is the Messiah. And you read the rest of the story, you realize the time came that they said, we believed from what you said that this was the Messiah. And then at the end of the story, they say, but now we believe because we met him for ourselves. They came. Jesus told his disciples, look, the fields are full for the harvest, ripe for the harvest, because the Samaritans were coming to get connected with Jesus. The Samaritans pressed Jesus, please, this little interview of the afternoon isn't enough for us. We need to spend more time with you. Come spend some time in our city. Jesus spent two days there. Can you imagine what that did to those disciples? The disciples had been very proper when they'd gone into town to buy food. It was considered okay to do the simple, I'll pay you and you give me the food, that simple transaction, even among the heathen. You can, you can buy food from them. You pay a fair price and you, you just get your food and get out. But now Jesus comes into the city. He sleeps in their beds. He eats at their table. He doesn't pay for the food. They're giving him the food and his disciples the food. And they have to, they have to accept it. God's grace is awesome. The disciples didn't understand what had happened to them, but later... When the gospel went to the Gentiles, think Peter and Paul, they recognized that God is doing a work for everyone. You, who have tasted the water of life, have something to share. This is a tough opportunity. We, we do the foot washing service. And as you wash someone's feet, and we talked about this last time, it's... Um, we're often more willing to wash than we are to be washed, but accept both aspects. The opportunity to serve is wonderful, but allowing somebody to serve us also, this is a symbol of your sins being cleansed. God is in the healing business. He is helping to change us from the inside out so that we speak truth, live truth, share life. And then once we have done the foot washing service, we gather around the table to rejoice together, having been forgiven, having prayed with one another. We rejoice with this bread and cup, the body and blood of Jesus. The very life of Jesus is yours. We will separate at this time for the foot washing service.